majority of us know about stories of refugees. However, to actually comprehend the changes imposed on one's life after they have been displaced, well, that story can only be told better by the people who've lived these stories themselves. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I've been a refugee before I was even born. Uh, my family has been a refugee for more than 50 years. Uh, my father, uh, you know, uh, my family's been affected by conflict and war intergenerationally. Hi, my name is Nila Nyakoa and thank you for joining me on my channel. Today I will be talking to Nial Dang. Now Nial is a South Sudanese refugee who was born in an Ethiopian refugee camp to South Sudanese parents before fleeing to Kenya at the age of 11. While in Kakuma camp in Kenya, he also lived there for a father 11 years before he moved to Canada in 2021, where I will be talking to him from today. A thought-provoking episode that I do hope you do enjoy and does empower you a little bit when it comes to Martyrs Refugees. Also, if you do enjoy the video, please don't forget to subscribe. There is a subscribe button down below here. Just click subscribe. If you like the video and you've already subscribed, make sure to leave a comment, question, or even a suggestion, and we will be happy to hear from you. Well, Niall, it's good to speak with you again. It's been quite a while, you know, and uh, since the last time we spoke, you were in Kenya, and now we are speaking, you are in Canada. How are you adjusting life there after 11 years living in Kenya at the Kakuma camp? Thank you so much for having me, uh, Nila. It's been a while. Uh, I hope you're doing okay. I'm doing great. Um, school's been good. Um, I said it's been like a big shift uh, moving from Kenya, uh, where uh, I still felt like it's home. Uh, and um, as you know, I spent 11 years in Kakuma refugee camp where I was able to find solace, hope. I was able like to meet great people who became close friends, uh, close family. And uh, then I had to move to Canada, different culture, different um, education system. I studied in Kenya, uh, different way of life. Um, no friends, I have to make friends from scratch. So it was like a big shift, uh, but yeah, I'm adjusting well. So the college I'm had, um, it, uh, it's like a small uh, close night community and uh, it's bring together like young people who are passionate about leadership because the school focus on leadership. So. I've been able to make friends. Uh, I've been able to get involved in my new community, in the student council, uh, in different clubs. Uh, so I'm moving uh, on well and uh, life is good. <laughs> I can imagine, but I, I cannot continue without asking you about how you've adapted to the weather, because in particular, Toronto, where you are, usually the weather, particularly in these uh, cold periods, can be pretty harsh compared to you know, the mild East African weather or climate, if you like, that you were so accustomed to. How did you adjust to that? Uh, I think that is one piece I haven't adjusted to, <laughs> I have to be honest. Uh, in Kakuma refugee camp, specifically in northern part of Kenya, it gets up to 40, and the average is between 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. And then when I move here, I'm in London, Ontario, which is two hour drive from Toronto, it um it it was like during the winter it's going up to negative 20 negative 25 and i was i was like skipping meals because i don't want to leave my room i just want to be stuck in my room <laughs> uh because it was warm so um that is that is one thing i've been adjusted but i know i'm so excited that the summer is coming and the sun is getting out again it's getting sunny uh the weather is like good now yeah yeah <laughs> That sounds really, really amazing because I, I had to ask this again because uh, even me, after I think about 13 to 14 years that I've been outside of East Africa, I've been living outside of East Africa, every time winter comes around, it's as if I'm experiencing it the first time. So I guess maybe, I don't know about you, maybe you will get accustomed to it much faster than I, I ever did. Now, um, this chit-chat aside, the main reason I wanted to talk to you about is... Um, 
First of all, you recently published an article in Al Jazeera English, by the way, very thought provoking. And in the article, you ask, and I quote you, I quote you, where were all these politicians, corporations, universities, and caring citizens now standing in solidarity with Ukrainians? When my village back in Ethiopia was burning 11 years ago, obviously, again, referring to the current events that are unfolding uh, in, 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 the Ukraine, in, in the war in Ukraine. So walk me through what was going through your mind when you wrote that piece and what particular moment triggered you? I'm assuming there's quite a lot to unwrap in that. Yeah, no, there was a lot. Um, I think just like everyone, I was frustrated by what was happening to the people of Ukraine, what was happening to their country. Um, and as someone who has uh, experienced uh, the horrors of war um, and who knows the horrors of war all too well, I stand in solidarity with Ukraine and that is what the world should do. We have to start in solidarity with them. Uh, and just, you know, looking at the television, uh, seeing, you know, uh, people trying to find uh, their properties on the rumble of their homes, seeing mothers running with, with their kids, uh, you know, seeing, um, you know, men having to stay behind to fight. My, my dad stayed behind 11 years ago and I had to travel to Kenya alone. It just is triggered a lot of my memories and my trauma that I experienced with war. And, and for me, I think uh, what, what I was trying to, to, to pass across, or the message I was passing across is that there's been a lot of debates about, about, uh, about the double standard that we've seen. Uh, there's a lot of debates about uh, the selective solidarity that Western uh, countries have shown, uh, you know, they stand in solidarity with Ukraine. We've seen a lot of attention being given to Ukraine but not the same exact attention being given to other, to other crises. Yeah. And I think uh, my, my message and what I was trying to pass across is that the whole attention that is being given to Ukraine now is really good. That is good. That is what we need to do. But we have to apply the exact same thing and make sure we give the same attention to other crises as well, uh, be it Yemen, be it Syria, uh, be it Afghanistan, be it Somalia, be it South Sudan, where I come from, it's country which has been devastated by war for decades and decades. And, you know, have friends from different countries who have, you know, experienced war as well. Uh, we have all connected because of our refugee stories. And I talked to friends from Syria, you know, who have been suffering from the same oppressor. And they're like, where were the world when, you know, uh, the same person that is doing this to Ukraine right now is doing this to us or the same country. So I think uh, the message is uh, that I'm trying to pass across is that it is good that the world is up and is done with Ukrainians, but we also have to make sure that it is not just Ukrainian, it is all refugees and all those who have to flee their homes because of war. Mm -hmm. And you, you just mentioned you do have, um, you know, you do connect a lot with a lot of fellow refugees or fellow young people who grew up as refugees from all over the world. Um, I think my um, uh, curiosity now from you is when you're watching the news, when you're watching the television and you're seeing little children caught up in these, uh, I would like to, to think it's an unnecessary war. Um, does it trigger those memories of you as a child um, back in 2010 when your parents had to flee from Ethiopia, having fled from South Sudan, and now they had to flee to Kenya? I mean, how, do they trigger those um, moments of you as a child going through this a similar thing? Yes, it triggers all those moments. I was thinking about my story day and day. I was seeing my whole village burning down again. I was hearing people screaming. I was I was seeing uh, I was hearing gunshots. All the brutal scene you know, of violence I witnessed when I was fleeing my country. I had all those images coming back to my mind fresh again, and 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 that is just uh, you know what 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 you know brought me to to just kind of try to engage with those conversations that uh, you know I wish the world was. So standing with me and my village when our village was burning 11 years ago, I wish universities stand up so that I can come and continue my studies uh, and, you know, fulfill my dreams as the university are doing now to Ukraine, which is really good. Uh, so, yes, of course, it, it triggered all, all the memories and, and seeing especially children having to run, uh, you know, having to walk long distance to get to the borders of neighboring countries. I was just, you know, you know, walking and unfolding my honey store all over again. Mm -hmm. And having lived this uh, uh, kind of, I would call it, for lack of a better word, a sort of like nomadic life, but in camps, because you, you, you were born in Ethiopia, then you moved to Kenya, and, you know, 
for many refugees, they even move a, a lot more than you did. Obviously, for now, you're, you, you, you consider yourself quite lucky because you've managed to be successful and now you, you know, you're studying in Canada. So what is the one thing um, you would want people to understand or to know about refugees, especially young refugees like yourselves? I think, I think uh, you know, this one thing, I think the first thing, and we have seen that, you know, with the media, with the biases in the media, I think the, the, the main narrative of refugees is portrayed refugees as, you know, as just numbers and, and you know, helpless individuals. Uh, you know, the images that we see on our TV screens are images of war and violence. I remember so many times traveling through through airports and people look at me and say, you don't look like a refugee. And I'm like, how do refugees look? So I think we, you know, we, we you know, often associate refugees with helpless people, hopeless people, you know, who, who have no dreams, who have no nothing. Uh, and I think uh, that is something that I felt you know, us to change, you know, uh, we have to move away from seeing refugees as just uh, these figures and these numbers that we see on our TV screen, that we see on the newspapers we grow up, to human beings with hopes, with dreams, with these stories, with aspirations, and who have, you know, who have, uh, you know, the same, the same, uh, the same aspiration that we all have. Um, so I think once we stop moving away from just seeing refugees as figures to seeing them as human beings, I think we'll get to understand that, yes, for young refugees, they are human beings with dreams. I was, I had dreams with another kid. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be able to go to university, be a journalist, travel the world, tell the stories of my community. I had those dreams and so many other young refugees are dreamed so. And I think uh, that is what we, you know, need to look at, that they are, they are human beings with dreams, with hopes, with aspiration. And they, like all of us, they just want to have the opportunities to be able to fulfill these dreams. Right. Um, and connect to that point, there is an ongoing discussion, not just in traditional media, but I'm, I'm sure you've seen this all over social media, about the treatment of different kinds of refugees, where many people have been arguing, uh, looking at the current Ukrainian refugees, um, they seem to be facing a far more accommodating Europe compared to, to people or to other refugees who fled other conflicts and hardships. Um, again, bringing you back to that point where you said sometimes the world or the media just portrays refugees as statistics. How would you agree with this? Do you think when it comes to, you know, statifying, if that's even a word, to, you know, making statistics out of refugees, this is only normally done when it comes to, you know, refugees from Africa, refugees from the Middle East and elsewhere. But when it comes to Europe, the story becomes completely different. Is that something you agree with or disagree with or something you've got a thought of? Yeah, I, th I think I agree on, on the fact and the reality that different refugees are being treated differently uh, by different countries. I think this is something we've seen uh, with how, you know, uh, you know, the EU, for example, uh, you know, uh, went ahead and, you know, put incredible uh, policies in place to accommodate European refugees, which is really good, right? Uh, you know, but that just showed that, you know, these countries know that, you know, they should actually welcome people and make sure, you know, they have, you know, they have uh, the right and, you know, freedom that they need to be able to, you know, to start their new lives. Uh, and I think there's, that is one thing I try to bring out in my piece, you know, for Al Jazeera that, you know, this, you know, how, you know, countries in the West have welcomed Ukrainian have shown that, you know, something, you know, important is possible, you know, we can actually, you know, be able to come together and elevate the suffering of those who have to flee their homes. So I think there's been different, uh, you know, uh, treatment of refugees. I agree on that. Uh, but I think also one thing that, I, that that has brought up is that it has shown us actually what is possible, which I think is a very good thing uh, yeah. that we can take forward as we move, you know, toward helping more people uh, who have fled their homes. Yeah. Do you think it's taken this uh, crisis in Ukraine uh, to sort of reveal blind spots or systematic failures when it comes to migration policies? Yes. Yeah, I think when you look at the global refugee regime, I think uh, this, you know, this crisis has exposed a lot of gaps uh, and opportunities as well in the whole system. Um, and, and, you know, looking at, you know, at gaps, I think, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, that... Um, you know, different groups, uh, you know, have different privileges, uh, you know, they have different 
rights that are not offered to, the, to different groups as well. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, that, that just showed that, you know, we actually know what is possible and what, what is workable. And uh, then, you know, there are gaps in the system that need to be, you know, improved and corrected. And I think one thing also that came out, which, which I think, you know, is also something that is, you know, that can help us, you know, move this agenda forward in a much more uh, humane way is that, you know, even the way people interact with the term refugee before has completely changed, you know, before the term refugee was like, was like, was like a taboo even saying it, you know, people see that something really bad. Uh, but, you know, right now we've seen, you know, uh, people putting, you know, Ukrainian, Ukrainian flags in their homes, in their cars, uh, you know, going to the street, uh, marching. So refugees, like, it has changed, you know, in just uh, a very short period of time. People see that something very different right now. And, and I hope, you know, this is something that moves forward, that we see all this crisis and all these human beings who have to flood their homes, uh, you know, as people who need, who need compassion and who need, and who need uh, empathy. Right. And um, again, in your piece, um, you write about your father's story becoming your own. And so for people who are not very familiar with your backstory, of course, we've talked so many times. I've followed you around on social media, etc. We've I've interviewed you before as well. Um, for someone who's cu curious uh, about you and your background, in a nutshell, how would you just describe your refugee story from when you were born to now? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've been a refugee before I was even born. Uh, my family has been a refugee for more than 50 years. Uh, my father, uh, you know, uh, my family has been affected by conflict and war intergenerationally. Uh, my father had to flee uh, South Sudan more than 50 years ago and settle in Ethiopia, where I was born and raised. And then in Ethiopia, my village was attacked uh, in 2010. I had to flee again and find myself in Kakuma refugee camp, uh, where I spent the last 11 years. And when I talk about my father's story becoming my story, is that when I was a kid, uh, you know, my dad used to tell me stories about his childhood in South Sudan, about how when they were kids, they would have to run and hide in the bush when helicopters come and dropping bombs in their village, when their village are attacked, when they're trying to drop people uh, into the military. So he told me a lot of those stories that, that kind of stayed with me, but I connect with them in a different way. But when I had to flee, when I had, when I woke up that single morning and saw, you know, houses burning, hearing gunshot, hearing people scream, I completely, you know, walked through my whole father's story. And, and it, it basically just became my own story. Mm -hmm. And what was life like growing up in Kakmakam? From what I know, it's a very vibrant community, very multicultural. You know, it's a melting pot of cultures from Africa. Um, just give us a little bit of a glimpse of what life is like for, for other people who've never been there and who wish to know what life is inside, not just a Kakuma camp, but I'm assuming we've been to the Dadaab camp, and these are the two largest camps there. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, just like so many refugee camps across the world, uh, Kakuma has its set of challenges uh, that refugees have to face every single day. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I said sometimes that when I was in Kakuma, there are moments while I would wake up, I have hopes. And when the sun set, my hopes are being crushed one by one because I ask myself, will I spend the rest of my life in this camp? I, I meet people who have been in the camp uh, since the camp was started in 1991 and they don't know when they will leave. Uh, and they, you know, the hopes are just being crushed every single day. I've seen parents who completely lost hope and, you know, they're trying not to, you know, uh, pass on that hope to their children. And, and uh, but something unique about Kakuma and something unique about all refugee camps is just the resilience of refugees and their courage and the ability to be able to rise over their trauma and to be able to rise over all the challenges they face every single day. You know, there, there is source of suffering or devastation in Kakuma, just like other refugee camps in the world, but they're also incredible source of victory, uh, incredible source of innovations, of leaderships, uh, you know, young people are stepping up. For example, during COVID-19, I was in the camp. Mm -hmm. I was working with a group of young people. We educated more than 10,000 people with information about COVID-19. Uh, you know, trying to make sure people are safe, uh, people wearing masks, you know, uh, businesses in the camp are producing handmade masks, uh, you know, producing soaps uh, to be able to, you know, to help people clean themselves, including the host community. So I think Kakuma is just an incredible place, you know, where you go, you see their challenges, but you also very much inspired by the label of hope that people have. 
they have all these challenges. Young people have all these challenges, but they have hopes. You know, they talk about their dreams of, I want to go to college. You know, I want to be able to do this in the future. You know, I want to be a pilot. I want to be an engineer. I want to go back to my country and be a doctor. They have all these incredible hopes. I want to contribute mm-hmm. to the world. I want to be an economist or something. So I think that is what you see in Kakuma. And Kakuma is like a vibrant multicultural place with people from 15 African countries. Uh, every single day, you know, I leave my place and I just get inspired seeing young people who have, uh, you know, almost no opportunities, but with a lot of hope. And I, and I think hope is something very powerful that can help us, uh, not just even in our personal life, but even in being able to build a much better and kinder world. Totally agree with that. And one of my favorite things is like, I, I, I think last summer I, I spoke with, with, young, uh, with a young man, I think he was from Burundi, and he also, his family f- fled to, to Kenya and, and he lives in Kakuma Camp. And he, I've never met so, someone who is even more Kenyan than I am. He was so proud of, of, of the country. He could speak Sheng. Like sometimes I would ask him to sort of translate the Sheng because I, I couldn't understand what he was saying. But, you know, and he was so proud of it. And he, he loves the country, loves the culture. He sees himself as more of a Kenyan. But at the same time, he sees himself like um, he wants to break out of that camp and move forward and go explore the world, you know, discover the world because now he's grown up here, now he's ready to expand. So these are some of the fantastic stories I get to hear from there. That said, it's been one year since um, the Kenyan government announced that they have plans to, and it's not the first time they've done this, but last year, I think in June, they said they want to uh, close the Kakuma and Dadab camps. Again, two of the largest and most well-known refugee camps in the world. You've got family and friends there. I mean, first of all, what is the update with this? Do you think this is going to happen? And how are people, your friends, your community, uh, there, you know, preparing themselves for this, if it happens? Um. You know, I, I'm actually writing a piece about it right now, about the whole... <laughs> <laughs> don't give away anything that you don't want to give away. Yeah, so I will... I will um, no, I will, I'll, 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 uh, I'll send that to you uh, and you can share with your, with your community as well and your audience. Uh, but for me, when the, when the, you know, when the government announced, uh, made the announcement last year, I spoke on BBC Swiley and I said, you know, um, the Kenyan government talk about, you know, uh, you know, refugee camp not being conducive for human growth, which, which I think is something that we all agree with. But for me, I saw that that shouldn't be the first, you know, discussions that we have to have. The first discussion should be finding solution for these people. No one wants to live in a refugee camp for the rest of their life. No one want, no one chooses to live in a refugee camp. People choose their because it is your only one holy options. You don't even have A or B. It is your holy options. You either live in the refugee camps or go back to a country where you're not safe, go back to a country that is ravaged by war. Uh, you know, people have left Kakuma before. You know, they would leave Kakuma, go to South Sudan, and then war break out again. The villages become no longer safe, and they have to come back to the refugee camps. I meet families who have about to flee three or four times. So I think the whole discussion that the Kenyan government, together with the international community, that have to have is that how do you find solutions for all these people? You know, is it resettlement to third countries? Is it integration opportunities? Is it repatriation of, uh, you know, opportunities when it is possible? I think that is the discussion that we need to have, making sure that we find solutions for these people before we even talk about closing the camps. When there are solutions, no one will stay in that camp. I can assure you that. And then coming now to the whole thing, I think it's, it's, very, it's, it's causing a lot of tensions, it's causing a lot of frustrations, it's causing a lot of anxiety. You have no idea what is going on. We, you know, the government made the announcement last year, and then toward the end of the year, the president signed a new refugee bill, uh, and and just everyone went quiet. So, you know, uh, I've been, you know, following the the elections and and uh, and the campaigns, and I've seen uh, both candidates are not talking about the issue. Uh, I'm trying to 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 summon them to ask them why, and what are their thoughts on that uh, on my piece. But I think, you know, the whole thing is just making sure that the discussion should be, you know, the Kenyan government, you know, which, which have been so generous, you know, I'm very grateful to the Kenyan government. Sometimes I feel more Kenyan than South Sudanese. I've spent, you know, uh, 11 years in Kakuma. I've never been to South Sudan, where I, my, I'm originally from. Uh, you know, I speak Swahili. I went back to Kenya in December. It's like home for me. You know, I use a Kenyan travel document. That is that is like the holy ticket to, you know, to a better future for me. I don't have any, any passport or something. 
So I'm, I'm very grateful to the Kenyan government, just like all other refugees. And I think what I would encourage is that, you know, the Kenyan government, you know, should continue doing this incredible work of, you know, providing a set up to refugees, but should go, you know, a long way in, how, in working together with the international community to make sure that these people have opportunities, uh, you know, be it access to employment, be it opportunities to be able to travel freely, and, and be it, you know, opportunities, you know, to, you know, integration opportunities. I think, you know, there are a lot of people including myself, you know, if, okay. if President Uru Kenyatta told me today, have a Kenyan citizenship, I'll take that. Okay. So I think, you know, there are a lot of people in this camp who just want solutions, nothing else. And, and the whole thing is, is causing anxiety, it is dashing hopes, you don't know what is going to happen. I talked to friends in Kakuma and they just lost. They're like, the camp closed and then what happened? Where do you go? That is the hand of us because I can't go to South Sudan, I can't go to Somalia, I can't go to Ethiopia, I can't go to DRC. Where do I go? That is the question they all ask and that is the question no one is able to answer. Right. And I'm actually quite surprised and taken aback by what you just said right there, because I personally thought you, if you have a Kenyan travel document, then it automatically qualifies you to apply for a passport. Uh, just it explain to me how this works. Yeah, it doesn't apply it to, it doesn't enable you to apply for a passport. So basically what happened with the whole refugee um, <clears throat> system. So in Kenya, um, when you have a refugee status, you're a refugee. And uh, there is no, uh, they are not, I'm not sure about the legal options available for refugees to become citizens. I think the government is trying to work on that right now uh, with the whole, uh, you know, camp closure and the discussion in place to try to make sure refugees can integrate with, into their new communities, which is, I think, is really good. Yeah, I think that is, that is something that has to be put in place that, you know, where refugees stay in the camp for so long, they can have opportunities to integrate, you know, have Kenyan citizenship, be able to, you know, integrate into their new communities, move, you know, work, start new lives, build new lives. I think that is, that is, you know, something that would have been help a lot of people get out of the camps and be able to contribute to the new community. So, yes, you know, a refugee uh, passport doesn't qualify you for a refugee travel document. It's issued by the government of Kenya, but it, it's still a travel document. I remember when I was flight, when I was flying back to Kenya, I was in the UK, uh, was, where I was transiting, and the immigration officer looked at my travel document and asked me for a Kenyan passport. And then I asked him to read it again, issued by the government of Kenya. So I said, yeah, this is a Kenyan travel document. He was like, you need a passport, you're a refugee, you're not Kenyan. So he asked to contact Kenyan immigration to be able to let me fly uh, into Kenya. So yeah, it, it's just so complicated. Complicated and quite a bit of a hassle. You know, I, yeah. I can't really believe that that's, that's, that's the case now. And hopefully things get sorted out. Because, oh, of course, if, if you're somebody who who adopted to Kenya and you see yourself as Kenyan, I don't see, um, and you're, you want to be a contributing, hardworking citizen, I don't see why you shouldn't get a travel, like a passport like any other um, Kenyan. Um, now, um, do you sometimes ever imagine how different your life could have turned out to be if events haven't didn't unfold the way they have for you since, like you said, even before you were born? Do you do you ever look back and think about those moments, or is it just looking forward, forward, and forward? Yes, sometimes I go back. You know, I think about if that day never happened, where would I be today? And for me, you know, I just I just envision this beautiful life. You know, I see myself being a, a journalist working for BBC, reporting across the world uh, about different stories, uh, reporting about these stories in my community, South Sudan, uh, reporting about the story of the River Nile. My dad used to tell me a lot of the story about the Nile. He grew up by the Nile. And, and um, you know, I think it just took me back to that journey. And when I look at it, I felt like every single step that I took and every single event that I took, kind of, you know, made my dreams, you know, almost impossible to reach, right? So all these events create those gaps, you know, in me being able to achieve my dreams. Um, so, yeah, so when I look back, I, I just see myself, you know, having the opportunity to go to school, having the opportunity to be able to attend a university, graduate, find a work, uh, travel the world, be able to tell stories of people and, and just be able to, you know, to do my part in being able to build a better world. Right. And uh, part of what you're studying now has sort of, you know, touches on filmmaking and journalism on the side. Like you said, your passion has always been to be a journalist, which you aspire to be in the future. Is there a part of you that's thinking 
yes, once I'm done with this and I'm good at, you know, filming and I can edit and I can go out there and go back to my, my, my ancestral home and tell all these beautiful stories that we don't get to hear. Is that something you're really looking forward to? Yes. Uh, so part of me is on that, uh, on the telling of these uh, of the stories. Uh, you know, I, I talk to my dad and I tell him sometimes that I just need to hear one story today. I'm, I'm feeling of one, but it's cool. Uh, and he will tell me this is stories and I'll just, you know, feel so happy. So I, I, I very much want to tell his stories. And now not just his stories of even, you know, uh, South Sudanese, but even his stories, you know, refugees, his stories of people who have to flee their homes, his stories of displaced communities that are always to told through the eyes of external observers, through the eyes of journalists, through the eyes of humanitarian workers, through the eyes of, you know, the government organizations that, you know, that portray these images according to their own uh, kind of view, right? So I think I want to be able to have the opportunity to change that and not just be a voice to these communities. I think, I think you know, the whole thing of saying I'm a voice to this community, I don't think, you know, that is a good way to approach this all uh, kind of crisis, you know, this, this miscommunication crisis. I think we need to, to give people a platform to tell their stories. Everyone have a voice. People don't just have a platform. Uh, so, you know, I, I think, you know, I'll be able to tell my stories and through my stories, you know, I can shed light on all of these stories of these people and be able to give young people a platform uh, to tell their stories. So I want to do that. Uh, also, I want to do, you know, work as well as, you know, you know uh, my major is in global uh, studies and I'm doing mine and journalism. So I want to be able uh, to look at my personal journey and my personal, you know, the psychology of the childhood of my world of war and violence and conflict and why that happened and what can I do to stop it. Fantastic. Neil, I wish you all the best and all that and all this. Well, and that's it from this conversation. We do hope you really, really enjoyed the conversation. Again, if you do have any questions, comments or suggestions, don't forget to leave them down below and we will be happy to get back to you or to even interact with you. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do so because I always appreciate your support and more videos with your support will be coming through faster and faster. Thanks again for watching and see you again next time.